pediatrician, Dr. Jack P. Shonkoff. Dr. Shonkoff is the Julius B. Richard Fam Three. Fam Three Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston. He doesn't want me to say all this, and now I'm rushing and I'm stumbling. And Director of the University-Wide Center on the Ch Devel Developing Child at Harvard University. He also chairs the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, a multi-university collaboration compromising scholars in neuroscience, psychology, pediatrics, Economics, whose mission really is to bring credible science to bear on the policy affecting young children. Please welcome our featured guest, Dr. Jack Shonkoff. Thank you very much for that kind and brief introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, so, um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. This is uh, really exciting to feel the energy in this room and the other um, conversations we've had since last night. So um, I really want to start by congratulating you on what you're doing here, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm going to try in um, the time that we have to address two issues. One, I'm going to give you a crash course in neuroscience and molecular biology to basically just kind of bring us all up to date on the fact that there are advances in science that are kind of sitting there waiting to be used to address the foundations of, of the things we care about, but also um, to talk about the need for thinking about taking the field to a different place. I mean, I think that, um, and that is in the service of thinking of this as a field that is vibrant and healthy and has a very rich knowledge base, and like any good organization, then thinks about where it goes next, rather than just kind of sit um, and uh, on its haunches and say, well, you know, we're doing really good stuff, which we are, um, but we need to move to another place. And that's what I hope to spend most of my time talking about. So um, the, the stereotype, I mean, the, the, the thing that isn't new is that healthy development in the early years is the foundation for everything that follows. That is not a breaking news story. And everybody here knows that, um, but it's not just because it sounds good and it's not just because your grandmother could have told you that, but it's because there's strong science behind it. But in fact, one of the things that I'm hoping that we can share today is that the most powerful science is the science that basically reinforces what your grandmother could have told you um, and kind of fits in with what common sense tells us. And when you have science and common sense coming together, we've got something really powerful going. So this is, of course, it's about educational achievement improving that and improving economic productivity, but it's just as much about a foundation for lifelong health. It's just as much about responsible citizenship, and it's about um, what the next generation of parents is gonna be able to do for their children, which will require less public um, assistance for that. Um, but the thing about the field is that, um, meanwhile, back in another part of the society, there's a revolution going on in biology. Um, in neuroscience and our understanding of how the brain developments, how the brain develops, um, in molecular biology and genomics and areas where most people, if you understand any part of that, uh, realize that this is going to revolutionize the way we treat disease. And, um, but what's not that well appreciated is that that same science that is getting down to the molecular level of how the difference between health and disease takes place, that science has tremendous uh, possibilities and tremendous potential to inform new ways of thinking about how we deal with some of the most vexing social problems facing the country. And that's my goal here is to show you that this is actually the same science for all of these areas. It's sitting here waiting to be used to inform new thinking, fresh ideas that cut across sectors that will make a much bigger impact on the lives of all of the children in our society, and especially those who are uh, starting with some strikes against them, and that that's the challenge. And we can keep doing what we're doing and make a difference. No question, a lot of what we're doing is making a difference right now. Or we could set our sights higher, and that's my goal today is to kind of, um, and I, I think I'm really bringing coal to Newcastle here, or I shouldn't talk about coal in Denver, I should talk about, sorry about that, uh, talking about coal. Not, um, but anyway, let me begin by addressing another very old issue and putting a new kind of face on this. Um, from the first time that any uh, state agency, any federal agency, or any program was established, everybody's moaned and groaned 
about the silos, the compartmentalization, the fact that we're fragmented and not integrated. Um, so that's not new. Um, and the fact is that, so this, for this slide, I only have four areas. I picked health, education, child welfare, economic development. We could put housing up there. We could put the TANF system up there. We could put a variety of, of policy and service delivery streams. Um, by and large, most of these have their own science base, their own knowledge base, their own tradition of the way they do things. And because we know that that's not good to have this fragmentation, and particularly because many of the families who most need help are involved with multiple agencies, and that doesn't make sense from a family's point of view, and it certainly can't be economically efficient to do it this way. So we have worked hard at building interagency agreements and shared data systems, all of which are good, but they haven't really accomplished what we want. And I, with the lens that I'd like to present for you this afternoon is that there are limits to how far we can ever go to get people who operate in different ways on a different knowledge base to work together. Um, and this is going to be one of the several examples I want to share with you this afternoon of where science is basically offering to help us out. It's saying that you don't have to just focus on interagency agreements, that there actually are principles that have come from multiple sciences and multiple perspectives that are converging on a core of a unified, single, integrated science of early childhood health and development that could be the basis of everybody feeding off the same knowledge base and not just trying to work at figuring how we can talk, how we can transcend these language differences from one agency to another, but all feed off the same science base. So what I'm going to do now is give you a crash course in that science base so we're all starting from the same place and then spend most of my time talking about what we could do with it to take the field to another place. So this first is a video. This video runs about a minute and 15 seconds. It took over two years to produce. Um, and the reason for that is because we subjected it to a scientific peer review process that would not allow it to go out. Um, if there was any neuroscientist in the country with any credibility, he would say, well, that's not really correct. Um, in fact, that we were close to the end, and then one person pointed out that one of the neurons was upside down, so we had to change it. <laughs> so this, this is your crash course in, what, in, in the basic principles of how experience shapes the architecture of the developing brain. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create <coughs> lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So those are the basic principles of how the brain is shaped by experience. It's built from the bottom up. It's a very few of these circuits are present at birth. Most of them continue all through life, but a huge amount of it gets built in the early years. Now this is what it looks like to kind of translate that brain science into thinking about how we build a foundation for school success, particularly focused on literacy, which we all understand is critical for um, being economically productive and being a responsible citizen. And we describe this nature of the experience, the serve and return interaction between 
uh, babies and adults. It means that the brain requires a, a responsive, interactive adult to get the right experiences. You can't learn as a baby from educational TV or videos. There has to be meaningful interaction. And so to kind of trace from infancy to being ready to succeed in school, in the beginning, there is this kind of unavoidable interaction between adults and babies. Babies look at you, you can't help but look and smile back at them when they start smiling and cooing. You can't resist doing that back as you talk to them and interact. All of this is literally shaping brain circuits, literally shaping brain circuits. And the absence of this interaction means the brain circuits that are expecting this kind of stimulation are gonna not develop in a healthy way. They will be disrupted. At some point, around about a year of age and into the second year, um, the interactions and the sounds and the cooing and the gurgling and then the repetition of, of, of different kind of sound interactions, uh, suddenly in the brain becomes associated with meaning and the brain starts to associate sounds with words and understands that objects have names and you have this explosion of vocabulary in healthy development between the first and the second birthday. And then kids start putting words together. And that happens not by sitting down and having um, a didactic session about learning, but by talking and interacting about everything that goes on during the day, in this case, going to the supermarket. <clears throat> now, at some point early on, well before the brain has the circuitry that's ready to understand that lines and squiggles on a page are actually written language that you can read, brain isn't ready for that. But we prime the brain, both through the interaction and around storytelling, with a lot of rich language so that children are exposed to books early in the context of developing their language. And at some point, the brain doesn't need adults to read to it anymore. It has the capacity to read by itself. And children then do their own reading. But they need adults to help them develop written language. Okay? They can't, once you learn to read, you can't by yourself then translate into the ability to write. But once adults have provided the scaffolding for children to learn how to write, then they are off to the races and they can tweet and write um, compositions for school and some will go on to become great playwrights and others will do all kinds of interesting things. But this happens in a sequence. You can't teach reading to a one-year-old. Don't believe those things you see on the infomercials on TV. The brain has to build the circuitry that's necessary for the skills and it's sequential. Now, that's the, that's the end of your crash course in healthy brain development. It's highly interactive. It's expecting that responsiveness, and it's building circuits and pruning away the ones it doesn't need and strengthening the ones that are going to be important for the skills we value. Now I want to shift to what we know from neuroscience and molecular biology and genomics about the impact of adversity on a developing brain. What happens in an environment in which you don't have that regular, predictable, stable interaction? So this first slide are data taken from a study, a national study of children in the child welfare system, all of whom were victims of abuse or neglect. And the question was, if you're, how, what is the relationship between additional risk factors in a child's life? Limited parent education, a mental health problem, and a parent a substance abuse problem, violence, in the home environment, as the number of risk factors or adverse experience goes up, what happens to your performance on a developmental test at age three? Now, in the world that we live in, in early childhood three, kind of middle age, right? But, but for the general population, three is still pretty early. You know, for people who are arguing about you know, how, how, much, how important is it to have preschool for four-year-olds, this is already, this is not early in the realm of brain development, so this is what we found that as the number of risk factors goes up, the percentage of children who fail a developmental test at age three, making them eligible for special education services, goes up to the point where once you get to six or seven risk factors, 90 to 100 percent of the children bearing that burden of adversity are failing a developmental test at age three, predicting that in the absence of some kind of intervention, that this is going to be a requirement for special education. You know, the underlying text for all of this obviously is um, identifying things early is better than trying to fix them later, and prevention is much better than treatment. But as you'll see at the end, but it's never too late. It's just that things don't turn out as well if we start later. Um, so the impact of early experience on learning is something that the public is generally getting a pretty, pretty good idea about. 
But what hasn't been given much attention is that the same adverse impacts on the brain that lead to problems in learning are having other adverse impacts on other parts of the body that are leading to a risk for disease. Okay. So these are data taken from a study in New Zealand in a town called Dunedin, where one year, about 30 years ago, every pregnant woman in the town was enrolled in a study, and data were collected prospectively through the pregnancy and then through the childhood and into the adult life of the children who resulted from that pregnancy. And these are data taken at age 32 of the, ch of the adults who were part of this. So all of the data were collected prospectively and are accurate and well recorded. This was looking at the level of a substance called C-reactive protein in the blood of a 32-year-old. This is a substance that is known to be associated with greater risk for heart disease. It's an inflammatory marker. In this population, a little less than 20% of the healthy, normal adult population had an elevated C-reactive protein. It means somewhat statistical greater risk for heart disease, but it's not a disease. It's just a finding in the blood. Of those who had a diagnosis of depression at age 32, the elevation of C-reactive protein was higher, confirming many studies that have been done to show that there's an inflammation component of depression, that people with clinical de depression have elevated, have elevated inflammatory markers in their blood. This was a confirmation, not a new finding. This was a brand new finding. 32-year-olds who had a documented history of having been maltreated when they were children had C-reactive protein levels at age 32 that were higher than people with depression. And those who had been maltreated and had depression had even higher levels. So I'll be a scientist first and say, what does this mean? The scientist's answer is, well, who knows? This is a single study. It doesn't really mean anything by itself. But this is part of a growing a scientific literature demonstrating elevated inflammatory markers in individuals who have had um, problems with adversity and uh, something that is associated with heart disease. Okay? And we also have other studies that show that heart disease is much more common among people who've had difficult lives than people who've had easy lives. So the take home message here, this isn't a smoking gun, but it's part of a growing literature that says, and this is the smoking gun, that things that happen early in life, whether you remember them or not, leave biological memories in your body, okay? So children who experienced significant maltreatment had an elevation in their inflammatory system that has nothing to do with what they remembered, but their body has been physiologically affected by that. So this leads to the second animation. I don't know, Al, did this one take two years as well? Maybe, they both took a long time. So this is your crash course in the biology of adversity, what toxic stress does to healthy development. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. So this is a pretty grim message, but it's not a fairy tale. Forgive me for uh, connecting to the auction here. But um, this is real. This is science. Um, and um, what it means and what we do about it um, 
goes, uh, goes as an unanswered question whether we pay attention to it or not. So this, and more important, it's like opening the black box of why is it that people who've experienced adversity have so many problems? It's going inside and finding out at the molecular level what is going on, because there has to be something going on. So with this as a backdrop, um, we asked the question of what's, what's the take home message from science before I now start to talk about innovation. And the take home message from science, and you will not find a scientist anywhere who will disagree with what I'm saying now. Scientists will fiercely disagree about which of these systems and which chemical and which hormone at which time, that, that's what's fueling a lot of energy and science. But this basic conclusion, everyone agrees, is supported by all the knowledge we have that early life experiences are built into our bodies for better or for worse. And for better, strong brain architecture, healthy organ systems, and for worse, trouble that then becomes a burden. And particularly when we look at the stress response system and the biology of stress, and by the way, please, nobody leave here with the take home message that what we have to do is protect children from experiencing stress. Wrong. Children have to experience stress. You can't learn to deal with stress unless you experience it. But the issue here is overwhelming stress that activates systems that don't get calmed down, that literally have a wear and tear effect on the body. And these are the increases in heart rate, increases in blood pressure, increases in blood sugar, increases in stress hormones that don't go down to baseline very much. And what this does is, when it extends over a period of time, it literally can lead to disruptions in brain architecture, producing problems in learning, which is different from having a bad attitude. If you can't pay attention, if you're having trouble following directions, if you're not able to kind of control your impulses, um, it might be because the circuitry that, that is responsible for that has been disrupted, not that you're just kind of a bad kid with a bad attitude, okay? I'm not gonna pass judgments about this, but the science is saying that a lot of these things are established early. But it's not just the brain, okay? So if the blood sugar stays up excessively, it puts pressure on the pancreas, you get insulin resistance, and you're more at risk for diabetes. If your inflammatory system is activated, in an excessive way, that accelerates atherosclerosis and puts you on a faster track to heart disease. This is real. What we do about it is a different question, but the reality of this science is unequivocal. So what we've done is begin to construct a simple logic model that tries to take these lessons and principles from science and say, so how do we translate this into what we ought to do differently in terms of policies and programs? So for starters, we're talking about health and development across the lifespan. From, pre, from the preconception health of a woman before she becomes pregnant to health and well-being well into adulthood. Same basic principles. How healthy you are, how ill you are, how, how, how competent you are, how much you struggle is a result of the balance between biological adaptations and biological disruptions. There are no perfect brains. There are no perfect cardiovascular systems, everybody has things that are relatively good or bad. The question is, are most of your systems functioning in an adaptive way, or are most of them functioning in a disrupted way? And that balance will determine where you are on the health, illness, and the learning um, problems with capacities spectrum. So what affects those biological adaptations versus disruptions? Well, decades and decades of scientific investigation, not only in the biological sciences, but a lot of it in the behavioral and developmental sciences tell us that there are basically three foundations of healthy development. S secure, supportive, responsive relationships, that is at the heart of it, for reasons that you all understand just from the animations. The second is the nature of the physical environment in which we live. Coloradans pay a lot of attention to that. Is the air clean? Is the water clean? Is the food supply healthy? Do we live in communities that have access to places to exercise where it's safe for people to get together and support each other? The physical environment matters. And the third is nutrition. I think you're still the best in the country on the rate of obesity, even though you're maybe catching up to everybody else or falling further behind. So we don't have to, it's all very complicated, but we can actually begin to simplify this. If we could focus, focus on building strong relationships, have children grow up in an environment of strong relationships, starting in their families, of course, and then involving other parts of the community. And if we can provide safe physical environments and provide nut good nutrition, we are off to the races. 
we're going to tip things toward biological adaptation. So how do we do that? We do that by building the capacities of the people who take care of kids and building of the capacities of the communities in which those people live. And this is where we can start to think about policies and practices in a logical science-based way, whether it's early care and education, health care, or zoning regulations, or housing, or TANF, or anything else. Each one could ask the question of to what extent are our policies and programs building and strengthening the capacities of communities and caregivers to strengthen the foundations of healthy development that will shift things toward positive adaptation that will produce a healthy, competent, law-abiding population. It's that simple in logic, but the devil is in the details about, okay, so how do we do that, wise guy? So that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about is how we take the science to not just build public will. This is where the presentations used to stop. So in the last slide, and therefore, investing in early childhood is important. So now it's a different ending. So therefore, we need to take this science and do better. We have to increase the impact of what we do. How do we do that? There are three strategies. One is to enhance the quality of what we're doing and take effective models to scale. Not everything we do is as effective as other things. We've got to start putting more money into things that make a difference and less in things that may feel good but are not doing what they need to do. The second is we have to build strong systems so things are coordinated and service delivery and data management is working well, and that's another important thing to do. What I'm gonna talk to you about is the third thing, which is what we're obsessed with right now, which is the need to formulate new theories of change based on this science to test new ideas about what we might do differently in every one of these sectors and learn from things that don't work rather than hope that the funder doesn't find out that what we're doing isn't working. I mean, I, I think that is one of the biggest barriers in the field. And this is, the way, this is the way healthy corporations not only survive but thrive. They try things and learn from failure until they get it right and then they stay at the top of their game. So this is the way, this is the conceptual framework that's guiding most of what we do right now. It's still based on sound science, but most of this science and these principles, as you all know, are now approaching about 40, 50 years old. Is that some combination of parenting education, sound nutrition, stimulating experiences for children and a health-promoting environment will promote readiness to succeed in school. Mostly we think of early childhood as a school readiness issue, as an education responsibility, and we think of it in terms of these requirements, most of which are provided by families and communities without any public assistance. But there's a part of the population that is experiencing so much adversity that it overwhelms the ability of these foundations to work. And the question is, what do we do about that? So now everything I have to say, and I'm gonna have to sprint because we're running out of time, um, is everything I've had to say up until this point is based on science. Everything I've had to say, that I'm going to say, is based on our best thinking about how we can use the science. So please don't ask me where the evidence is for what I'm about to say. I don't have any evidence. This is what we're thinking are some of the things that we should be trying. So the first is that we need, a, hate to use this word, the par we do need a new paradigm in early childhood policy and practice that has two features to it. One is, understand that this is as much about lifelong health as it is about learning. This is not just the responsibility of the education department. People who care about health and health care costs, people who care about prison costs, people who care about all these other, and have to understand that early childhood is not just about school readiness. That's what the science says. And the second is, a healthy development requires not just enrichment, but a combination of protection and enrichment. And how are we gonna do that? So here are our latest hypotheses. This changes minimally every six months, right? I mean, we're just kind of really trying to kind of think about what we should be doing about this. So the first hypothesis says that if we're gonna provide protection and enrichment for young children, we have to build capacities in the adults who take care of them, not just give them information and advice. We have to build capacities and skills to provide the kinds of environments and protection that children need, particularly in those who have very limited education and very limited resources. So here's where the two for and the three for and the four for start to happen. The capacities that we need to build for effective parenting to manage a home, to manage a home environment, planning, monitoring, problem solving, are the same capacities you need to be employable 
in the workforce. So we have our employment programs here and our early childhood programs there. They should be converging on the same issue. This is about building adult capacities. If people say, well, wait a second, what about the kids? The answer is children grow up in an environment of relationships. If we want to do better by the kids, we have to build better capacities in the parents. And quite frankly, in some of the early childhood programs, we have wonderfully dedicated people with limited education who are paid very little, and they need capacity development as well. And if we want to think of this from a neighborhood level or a community perspective, because there's a lot of attention to this, it's not just about families and programs, it's about communities. So take the theory of change. So rather than just thinking generally about building strong communities, the science says, think about what you're doing at a community level that is reducing sources of toxic stress, that are putting burdens on families that are activating stress systems that are causing the kinds of problems we're doing. Make it easier by having the community help families have less struggles to deal with around violence and other kinds of distractors. So this gets us to this issue of what kind of skills are we talking about? And this is where science is now giving us some good things to play with. The front part of the, there are deep parts in the brain that mature very early. The amygdala, where fear and threat circuitry is developed, is fully mature before age two. It's like serious threats in the first two years, you've got problems in that circuitry for the rest of your life. But the prefrontal cortex, where a lot of these higher level skills are, this planning, problem solving, capacity building, following rules, figuring things out. This is the part of the brain that takes the longest time to develop. And these are the skills. We call this the air traffic control system in the brain rather than talking about effortful control and other kinds of jargony things. Um, so if these are the skills that have to be built, and they're kind of intuitive, but we haven't focused on them, science is now telling us, I'm going to give you another break here. Mother Nature. It's like saying, I'm trying to make it easy for you. Just listen to me. Okay, the part of the brain in which these skills develop has the longest, oh, excuse me, no, I have to say this first. Let me just go back. Um, here's the challenge. The challenge is that there's this notion of plasticity. It's the adaptability, the flexibility of the brain. And the sad fact is that as the brain matures and builds its circuitry, it gets less and less flexible, and less adaptable. And you see there's a very steep drop in the early childhood period. The good news is it doesn't ever get to zero. If the screen were wider, and it went up to 110 years old, if there was somebody here who was 120 and learned something new and went home and remembered it tomorrow, a new circuit has been made. Okay? So it's never, it's never impossible, but it gets harder. It's harder to change. It's harder to develop new skills. And the energy costs to the brain as it matures are tougher to have to adapt. So, and it's also, and this is the biological explanation for why remediation is more expensive than prevention and why dealing with aggressive behavior in a 22-year-old is harder than a 12-year-old, which is harder than a two-year-old um, because of the adaptability and the costs. So here's where Mother Nature said, okay, this is a sad truth. I can't change the fact that the brain gets less flexible, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity on the kinds of capacities that adults need to provide what young children need. And actually, it's not just Mother Nature. Biology works this way. Biology works in a way to try to make things come out right, as long as we don't screw it up. So the circuits for executive function skills and self-regulation are in the part of the brain that has the longest period of plasticity. So it doesn't level off and kind of reach its top until age 30 years, not months. Okay? And the steepest peak of rate of acceleration of executive function skills is in the period from age three to five. Okay. And we see social class differences in executive function skills beginning in infancy now. This is just five-year-old data. So these divergencies are happening early. Kids who are living in tough environments are not learning how to be well organized and focus their attention. This is the time, and these skills get better with practice and coaching. So nature says to us, and science says, you know, if you don't get it, right early on, I'm gonna give you one more chance because this stuff takes a long time. And it turns out that between the ages of 15 and 25, um, not only is that you're just barely getting to the peak at age 30, but there's actually an acceleration between 15 and 25 of these higher order abilities to really focus, solve problems, control your impulses. Um, so it's a window. And there it is, the time we could be building these skills and what are we doing? We're giving people advice and information 
instead of building the skills that are still adaptable and plastic in their brain. Now, where's the data for that? I don't know. This is a, this is a hypothesis we have. And if it turns out to not work, we're going to figure out why it didn't work and try something else and not say, I hope the funders didn't find out about it, as long as the funders understand that this is about innovation, not about uh, you know, macho proving you could do it the first time. Um, so this leads to the last thing I'm going to say before closing this up, which is that this has required a whole new way of thinking about what we mean by evidence. So we are, now, we are living in a world appropriately of evidence-based services. Everybody understands that, evidence-based policies. And, and I, I would be the last one to say that we should form a national association for non-evidence-based intervention. Okay. But the issue here is how do we define evidence? And we've taken a very narrow definition of evidence. We've defined evidence as something that's been proven in a randomized controlled trial and something for which we have cost-benefit data. Those are two very important sources of evidence. But if that is the only evidence we're going to count on, you finish the logic, then we're going to do nothing new. You can't do anything new if in order to do it, you have to have the evidence to prove through an experiment over years that it worked. So how do you, how do you think about an environment that will entertain and nurture new thinking and be, be kind of loyal to the concept of the importance of evidence. So my suggestion is that the third piece of the evidence picture should be the evidence of what we're learning from neuroscience and molecular biology about how development happens. And what that means is that we start with some very important evidence that's grounded in scientific concepts. And that it gets turned into some ideas of things we could try. And that we bring into the early childhood world and the whole world of health and human services and education what is the bread and butter for the corporate world and has never been in health and human services, which is learning by trying, okay? And this concept of having a hypothesis, you try something and you have the short cycle feedback and you see whether it looks like it's working. Not taking a year and a half to nail down everything you're gonna do in order to get the funding and then be stuck for five years to not change what you said you would do and analyze your data and see what you get at the end. So this is learning as you go. And it's not just saying I have a feeling that this is working, it's measurement, it's hardcore, but it's a fast cycle learning and it's a stepwise process that gets us to break through outcomes, which works in every other field that knows what innovation is about. We will not get breakthrough outcomes if we require saying, stipulating what everything is before we do it and have to wait seven years to see if we were right. Nobody can take that risk and put seven years into one idea because every outcome that's a breakthrough in the innovation world is built on a lot of failures with short-term learning. So this is gonna require really changing the game. And it means there have to be places that understand that. This is why public-private partnerships are key because business people understand this and we don't. And we have to learn this from them. So what we've been doing over the last, I can't believe it's only been 16 months. Feels much longer than that. We have been trying to build a learning community to drive innovation around the country, we've created, we have now, we started with 65 people, we have 400 people now involved in this on a password protected website. We have working groups that are coming up with ideas of things to try, incubating ideas, and then looking for places to try them. And we have been looking for states, this is states and provinces, because one of our uh, innovating areas is in Alberta, Canada, which has some really interesting things going on. So we have innovating states that say, we wanna try some new things at the policy level. We have innovating programs that say we're willing to try some things at the program level. All grounded in science, co-created. Scientists and pro people on the ground in programs or in, in policy arenas saying let's try something new, let's have a theory of change and let's see how to do this. And now we're also adding that middle level of innovating communities. The idea is not, we're gonna change the whole country and then the world by doing it, by figuring out how to do it first in a couple of places. So it means that there's cross, a lot of cross-fertilization between the groups that are generating ideas and the people who want to co-create them and test them. And then there's this horizontal integration. Get a few states that want to share what they're learning with each other. Get programs around the country that want to share what they're learning. Not wait till something's published seven years later or never published because that's not what people do. And the same with communities. And working with the Promise Neighborhoods Initiative um, which is now a network of about 40 communities around the country, to bring this to people who are doing things at a community level. Um, and then ultimately, the places that will really make the breakthrough outcomes will be where there's vertical integration. We're at a state level, a community level, and a program level. 
you've got people all at multiple levels doing this. Yes, it's complicated, but no, it's not an exercise in futility because we're very focused on where we think the outcomes are going to be. And I can guarantee you that the best things we come up with are things I can't even dream of now that we're going to be doing two or three years from now as opposed to just fighting for more money for the same programs. So this is my take-home message for you. Um, the science, we, we have two choices. We can take the science, and, and they're both valid. Obviously, I'm, I have a preference for the second, but they're both important. There's still a lot of work to do to take the science to build public will for the importance of doing even what we're doing now in early childhood, and that's important work. But there's got to be some part of the field that says we need to move to a new era in early childhood. This is not a matter of fully funding the great society programs of the 1960s. This is kind of, and the reason we've been bold enough to start doing this are the following three things. One is practitioners and community leaders are hungry for new ideas. And you people, an example of that, everywhere we go, it's like we've touched a nerve. People are hungry for new ideas, particularly for those things where we know we're not making as big an impact as we need to make. P policymakers, civic leaders, philanthropists, business leaders are looking for fresh thinking about how they're going to get bigger returns on their investment. People who care about this, people who are not saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of, of not completely solving this problem. People who are in there but want bigger returns on investment. They are right. We've got to have bigger returns on investment. In the end, most important, we need those for the children and family we're serving in for our collective interest in where the population is going to be in the next generation. And the final thing is, which is kind of what I'm sharing with you today is that science is sitting there saying, use me. Here I am. And by the way, where I am now is not where I'm going to be next year. It's not where I'm going to be five years from now. Join me. And as I learn more and more, think about how you can use this to s stimulate and catalyze innovative strategies, new ways of doing things that build on best practices, that don't throw out what we're doing. Start with the best of what we're doing, but say that's where we start, not where we end. And think about how we can create breakthrough impacts, not just another two or three points on some measure that we're doing. Because the, 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 the end goal here is significant impacts in equalizing opportunities, not outcomes, but equalizing opportunities, a le more level playing field for kids who are clearly starting life out with important physiological burdens that are being imposed on them and the fact that we have less and less social mobility in this country right now. It is getting harder and harder for kids to break out of lower income groups. So this is, I'll end by saying, this is making the American dream a reality of a possibility for everybody and using science to do that. And the American dream is not moving the high school graduation rate from 60% to 75%. That is not the American dream. The American dream is much greater than that and that that's what science is giving us, some new ways of thinking. So I'm sorry I ran over. We started a little late. Here's our website. If any of you want, um, we have a lot of material. We've been translating complicated science in ways that non-scientists can understand. I invite you to come on the website. These two videos are on the website. You can take them down and use them. It won't cost you anything. We have a lot more material. Um, and um, I'll end where I began and to thank you for giving me the privilege of coming here to Colorado see the energy and excitement and the creativity of what's going on here, and who knows, maybe we can do some stuff together. So thank you very much.